everybody. Welcome to Pockets Full of Soup, the storytelling show. I'm your host, Jared Petty. I'm joined by the immensely tall, the ridiculously talented, the terribly tattooed. Yeah. 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 This all true? Yeah. Agreed. Not to mention handsome. Oh, shit. Got that pretty pretty anime hair. I do have anime there. hair. go cooing it up a little yeah, bit. Yeah, a little bit. Who's a, who is your favorite uh, Saiyan or Super Saiyan? <sighs> oh, I was, a tr- I was always a Trunks fan myself. A Trunks fan? Because he's, yeah. he's, he's John Connor with a sword. When did you catch on to the fact that they were all named after food and underwear? I don't know. I don't know. I got it. I so I was. I I did a. I did an episode of of uh, podcast beyond plug plug plug. Um, okay. Where podcast and every, beyond every week on IGN we do. A, you know we do a podcast about PlayStation. But we put stupid nicknames in parentheses like, you know, I don't know Jimmy the Shark, whatever. I, that's a <laughs> terrible example. This week it was like. I don't, and I, it's always trying to think of four things that kind of go together, but des- not, don't necessarily. We did, we did uh, mobile suits from Gundam Wing a couple weeks ago, and then I just did uh, Genki Dama and Gallic Gun <laughs> okay. and uh, Dodon Pa. And Marty was like, "What? What are these words?" And I was like, "Those are Dragon Ball Z movies." And he's like, "Are they really deep cut ones?" And I'm like, "No, they're the Japanese ones." Duh. Um, I got into Dragon Ball, and I was like, "Oh, I don't want to. I don't want to try. You know, trifle with this." This Americanized version, like you I need, just I need like to, you're diving right in. Give me the real stuff. How, wait, about what year is this? Uh this would have been probably 2001. Okay, 2001. So this, yeah. you're you're right on the edge of these being available on disc, but perhaps you don't have the. I mean, do you have the? Uh, do you have the PS2 yet to play your DVDs? Or uh, my best friend had a PS2 pretty early on, but mostly we were watching Burned. Uh, okay. Was it VC? Not even not. They were VCDs. 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 Ooh, ooh. So I had a collection of Dragon Ball. Dragon Ball Z ripped from, uh, it was like ripped from Japanese TV, probably 96, 97. So they were reruns, uh, and just the worst, just the worst colorization, just, just really, really just garbled as hell in real player format. So I was looking at like, like cam girl resolution. This is kind of abstract art. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Did it, did it enhance the experience? I think so. Cause I'd get like, I'd get like weird you know, weird pachinko commercials and, uh, yeah. I mean, I learned about the company like, uh, Glico when I was watching these weird ads and then I moved to California where they actually sell Japanese candy in stores. And I was like, good eco. Who do you think the, the, the brave missionaries of Dragon Ball Z were that were, that were bringing this Holy gospel to you from television there over on VCD? Like, do you think it was American expats or do you think it was as Japanese people trying to share it with, with the world? I would be willing to bet that somebody from China was involved. Yeah, Dragon Ball kind of ubiquitous uh, here in. A, I, I don't think there are a lot of uh, anime fans of a certain age in America that didn't come in through Dragon Ball. Is that assuming too much? Uh, so I actually the first first exposure was uh, Japanimation, which was of course like if you go far enough back into a Suncoast or an Fye or a uh, I don't know Sam Goody, you'd mm-hmm. find like that weird wall of like half of it was like rage against the machine VHS music video collections. And you kept going and maybe there'd be like not quite porn, but like playmate pinup videos. And okay. then, and then there'd be like dominion tank police, mm-hmm. bubblegum crisis, uh, bubblegum crisis, ghost mm-hmm. in the shell. There was all this stuff. And it was, it was, it was Japan animation. And, and, um, was it sci-fi channel would also do like weird, like late night stuff. And I distinctly remember walking down my road when I was probably in fifth grade, uh, and there'd been this uh, dubbed copy of Akira floating around that like Ooh. all my friends had just like copied. And it was it was like copied from, I think from an actual copy of the of the movie. Like somebody okay. had the two VCR set up. So and they actually the... almost had a legitimate like master. Yeah, it was it was like it wasn't off of TV. It was like an actual copy. Um, but we had that, and we'd watch that backwards and forwards, and then the internet started showing up, and we'd get like you know, five megabyte like quick time files of like Canada's motorcycle slide. <laughs> um, and then in, I guess 98, like Pokemon surfaced. Right. And Pokemon was like, I was like, what, what are these little, what are these little fellows? Who are these strange men? So do you think that was the gateway more than Dragon Ball? Again? Uh, I mean, Pokemon was, Pokemon was stri- shortly before Dragon Ball. Dra- okay. I mean, there was, there was Dragon Ball, but that was like this weird, like, I guess, I think Sailor Moon came first, first. Okay. Um, that was probably, I mean, I remember seeing that floating around probably like third grade. Okay. Um, but even before that, there was stuff that was just dubbed over. There was Robotech, obviously. Yeah, there was, that, that um, was my gateway as, as a little yeah. kid. Like Robotech was this amazing thing that was somehow more beautiful than every other cartoon yeah. on television. I mean, it's yeah. funny because you go back and you look at the early, like the early stuff obviously for, for my, my generation was Toonami. Yeah. Which was basically, they did this wonderful thing where they were like, 
Hey, remember that stuff from the kind of the stuff that your older brother's friends were into, such as Thundercats and Voltron? Well, here's Dragon Ball Z. Yeah. Oh, you don't know what that is, do you? But it looks kind of the same, but it's sort of different. It's kind of weird. And you're like, but but I was just watching Tom and Jerry before this. What are you giving me here? And then what you get. Yeah. Something that goes all the way up um, to 9,000, if not beyond. Exactly, yeah. yeah. So do you enjoy it still? Uh, yeah, totally. Yeah. No, I went, I've actually went, gone back and um, revisited the... The manga. Um, ah, I think that manga. I think that a lot of um, a lot of anime that sucks or that people just don't get into is stuff that typically gets uh, stretched out in anime form. Mm-hmm. It has filler episodes, and sometimes filler episodes are awesome. There's an episode of DBZ where Pickle, Piccolo and Goku have to go to the DMV and get their licenses. <laughs> I've never seen that. It's one. it's just it's sublime. It's yeah. so good. Um, there's another one where uh, Gohan gets stuck in a cave and talks to a robot who tried to kill his father for like. An entire episode. <laughs> it's just, I think that's what happens. You're making a show that I, that I mostly associate with screaming sound like artistry. Uh, I, I, yeah. I, I may, need to, may need to revisit some of this. So I, that's the thing, though, is, is the comic is where it's at. Okay, the comic the is, there's, about, yeah. there are legitimately parts of, of the anime that are, I don't know, five, six episodes that are panels. Mm-hmm. Just straight out of Yeah, the, just panels. I remember in Japan, Japan's a nation of voracious readers. Uh, it really is just just reading is almost ubiquitous there, mm-hmm. and almost any business you go into, little mom and pop cafe on the corner, uh, a barber shop is going to have racks of books. Yeah, uh, that include racks of manga. I remember my shrink's office in Japan; uh, its bookshelf was pretty much entirely Dragon Ball, Dragon Ball Z, and Doctor Slump. Just this this yep. wall of yeah. Akira Toriyama. Uh, Toriyama's stuff. Toriyama's great. Yeah. Um, it's funny though because I also I didn't realize that my first exposure to him was before DBZ. It was my friend playing Chrono Trigger, mm-hmm. uh, or just having seen like you know Dragon Warrior ads or stuff like that floating around. Oh, uh, and it's just I don't know. It was it was so strange. Also, the second that it clicked that that was in the '80s, I think that explains a lot about my sensibilities because I was reading almost these like these time capsules Mm -hmm. that, that when they're released in the West, it's like, you know, 2002, three, it's new, but this is stuff that was being published in Japan in like the late eighties. Wow. I mean, if you look at it, there's like the whole trunks thing. He, he's like traveling back in time to fight robot men from the future. Okay. And then it gets tangled. It basically goes from Terminator to Aliens. Uh-huh. And like, there's a very clear like you get Cell, who's absorbing yeah. people and parasitic and all that stuff. And it just gets it gets very strange. And then they dip into like just strange pink genie people. And I don't remember the pink genie people. Oh, Mr. Boo. Oh no, Majin, Majin, Majin Boo. Well, I, you got to remember yeah. that Dragon Ball was more my little brother's thing. Okay. And uh, I've I've tried to leaf uh, leaf through some of the manga. I've never gotten very far. I think so I need to jump back. And the give the key time. thing is you got to start at the very beginning because okay. the, the manga is just Dragon Ball straight through. Okay. Dragon Ball Z is basically like Saved by the Bell, the later years, the college years, or whatever. <laughs> like it's just kind of, it, well, and it's it's amazing that it actually took off stateside at all. Do you think it's because of tsunami that that, that that's oh, totally. what they chose to carry? And that's also, why it's a big also, there's stuff that if you, I mean, the the early stuff, the very early, it's it's very kind of coming of age. It's it's like a lot of like you know kind of potty humor and like oh my god, I saw a booby and like just okay. really corny. It's more it's more akin to the way I describe Dragon Ball is it, it's it's if Looney Tunes mm-hmm. over time without it being too weird. Turned into X Men. Oh, I love that. Yeah. What a beautiful analogy. Yeah. Will you please write that? I I, I think I have happen? somewhere. Okay, but that's yeah. Lovely. Yeah. That's awesome. So, guys, uh, your fans, uh, friends, of pockets full of soup. I imagine if you're watching here, if you're not, and you're new. Welcome. We are a show about the people that we're thankful for, the things that we're thankful for, the places we're thankful for, and this is a little uh, off form for what you may be used to seeing here. That's because occasionally we're going to go out and do some more topical things. Uh, Today, uh, this discussion, fairly random, uh, of Dragon Ball Z is going to lead us into a discussion of uh, one of my friend Max's passions, talents, uh, and uh, occasional dalliances. Yeah, art. Art. Uh, we're going to talk about the art. That's right. The 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 art, as it were, the visual arts. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's uh, all kinds of art out there, and I guess Dragon Ball makes a pretty appropriate segue because uh, Toriyama. As much as I enjoy Dragon Ball, to me, Toriyama first, last, and always is going to be Chrono Trigger and uh, Dragon Quest. Mm-hmm. Uh, that that's where I love his work most. From my my desk at work is covered in slimes. I yeah. love that. Well, you are a, revol- a revolting man. You're just leaving yeah. your fluids all over the place. Well, you you saw my desk at the old yeah. office. It was kind of covered in horrible revolting fluids. So I feel like that's that's just like a totally eccentric thing stateside. But if you go to Japan, the slimes are everywhere. Mm-hmm. I was really surprised. I was in a, I've been like a, 
was it an not an FHM? That's a magazine. HMV mm-hmm. is that a HPV? It's it's a record store. that's three letters. I forget the name of it. I haven't been there since. FY no maybe yeah. I don't know. FYE. I, no, it's not that one. It's anyway. It's one of those ones that like. In, in the same way that like they still have Zima over there, this yeah. weird holdover from the '90s is yeah. still around. Uh, it, I was in there and I was like, you know, like poking around in like the you know the video game section, the music section, and there's like one of those little kind of like kiosk checkout counters, and there's like a bunch of like just badass like Harajuku punk like whatever like Japanese people behind the counter. I'm like, I mean, record store employees are kind of universal. They're yeah. always going to be cooler than you, no exactly. matter no. where you are. Look, who look you, at what they do. You could be a seven foot tall white guy with you know Mystic Gohan hair, and they're they're still like. <laughs> Whatever. They sell you records if they so choose. Right. Yeah. Um, but they had this this entire like procession of slimes across the countertop. And I was like, I had like immediate flashbacks to Tower Records where we'd be like, oh, these are, here are um, our mini mates or whatever we had there. But, well, it is impossible to watch Japanese TV for more than 90 minutes without hearing the Dragon Quest theme playing in the background of a variety show. It, it is truly universal. That's there. bizarre. It, yeah, it, it is. It is a cultural touchstone to the level of something like like uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark sure. over here or something like that. That is truly a huge deal. Probably bigger than that even. Yeah. It's like McDonald's. Yeah. And, no, I kind of uh, get that. Um, but that art. Uh, yeah. It, Max, I'm not an artist and you are, which makes me insanely jealous of your abilities. What is it? How do human beings take a collection of lines and... On a, on, on a flat surface and turn them into something that we understand what it is and what it's supposed to be. There's a lot of different ways you can go about that. Uh, I don't think I'm a particularly good artist in terms of, like, I, I make stuff that I make stuff that is within exactly the boundaries of something that I'm happy with and by the nature of that, I think other people also enjoy it sometimes. Okay. Uh, th- I've quit art probably half a dozen times in my life. When you say quit art? Uh, just just been like i hate everything and i'm done with it and throw it away and like just, you just and, throw your all your art away no not all not, not all of it just, just, say you're never just, gonna do just it. the practice like oh. i basically it's like it's like quitting it's like you know quitting the track team to go be in a punk band like except more more in reverse than that um i just think it's funny we talk about this by way of, of toriyama uh the thing that i remember just distinctly making me do this the first time is leafing through a pile of Dragon Ball Z fan art, which was kind of my, it was just almost meditative. Mm-hmm. Like I used to come home from school every day and I would, uh, I would, I think I'd either program the VCR to record Toonami or and I'd like bank a bunch of DBC episodes and I'd just sit there and, and just draw. But I'd always be drawing, it was never quite that like, that sort of, when you think anime fan art, there's either, there's, you've got the, the library the school library printer printout of whatever it is you like that okay. maybe has like the URL of the JPEG file from the GeoCities page that you stole it off of. Oh, okay. Uh, and you've got that on Age one hand. Angel Fire for life. Yeah. And you've, yeah, exactly. Angel Fire, tri- what is it? Tripod, tripod. or, yeah. Yeah. Uh, or GeoCities, or GeoCities. And there are some people who, you know, they'll take like a piece of binder paper, like they don't get like sketch paper or whatever. And they'll be like very carefully with pencil going over it. And then maybe they go over it with like ballpoint. Like they don't ever go full like artsy enough that they want to go get supplies. Yeah. Uh, and that's kind of like when you think like fan art, it's like that. Uh, I did sort of a mix between that and then people who are actually like challenging themselves and pushing themselves. But the thing that I was doing was more like, I never really challenged myself with composition. I was never like, I'm going to develop my own style. It was always kind of trying to ape Toriyama's style, but I'd kind of like move people around or I'd move things around. Like I'd look at, I'd have a bunch of the, the manga open and I'd okay. be looking at his, the way he drew different p- characters, but then I'd also have like an action figure. I love action figures. That's one of my favorite things. Uh-huh. And the most, the most, I guess, Hey, look over there. Excuse for having action figures as a 30 year old man is that, Oh, they're actually a great reference for art. And then people are like, uh-huh. Oh, of course. And they're like, Wait, wait a minute. Why do you need to draw Ninja Turtles? You're 30, you know? So are you saying that your entire, like, your entire infatuation with visual art is actually an excuse to keep a collection of grotesque man-child toys around? Toys no, that's a good argument, though. <laughs> um, I would love to design toys. That was actually my, my dream as a, as a kid, that was to get into that. Do you I, work in sculpture, then? then? Like, do you uh, do yeah, I've done, I've done sculpture. I used to make custom action figures, custom, like, Lego figures. No way! I was just like a... I did, like, this weird mix of... I did dork arts, is what I did. Okay. I did, like... How did this start? I just was always an, I was an, always an artsy kid, you know. Yeah. Like I always liked to draw, and like there's stuff where I go far enough back in like the the Tupperware full of old schoolwork and pictures that my mom kept that I still have because humans are a disease on this earth. But um, <laughs> uh, like I was good at watercolors as a kid, and watercolors are hard as shit. Yeah, like, and watercolors, you were good at them. and it's like I was like using them the way you're supposed to use watercolors. Like there's a certain kind of 
there's a there's a good way to do it. And yeah. then of course there's using them like you'd use inks or Copic markers where you're using the basically color of the lines and you're not really going for washes or anything like that. Okay. And when I'd be I like I have like really I have like really good colored pencils because my like there's a lot of art artists in my family and like my mom was always like trying to encourage me. Yeah. But I'd be like I'm going to draw Oolong the pig and I'm going to write Oolong the pig next to him and I'm going to take up this entire piece of Bristol board with this like one picture that doesn't really do anything with the rest of the space. Like going through my fan art, there was always like this sense of, oh, you just put this thing in the middle and there's like nothing surrounding it. Like you're just floating in a void, effectively wasting paper. Okay. Which always, always fucked with me. And also like I'd go to class, I'd go to art school or not art school or art, just art class with other kids who were like, I mean, I guess they, they would just be like, I'm drawing the thing that I'm, I do like a still life with flowers or like, I'm going to draw a thing that I'm, I'm passionate about. I'm like, I'm passionate about future trunks because he comes back in time <laughs> with a sword and fights androids and he hates his dad too. And because that, yeah. <laughs> how did your teacher feel about that? Like, when I mean, was- I remember distinctly in, um, God, it was freshman year. I was at a very bad school. It was a bummer because my best friend's dad was the art teacher at the school. Okay. And this is like a guy who I knew, knew me first of all, but also knew the kind of crap that I was into because my best friend, his son, was also into it. So okay. he'd, be, he'd be like, ah, oh, you're drawing that stuff. Christopher draws the the Super Sands or whatever. Uh, and this other lady was just this weird disconnected, like she had that kind of, I don't remember if she actually had the macaroni necklace on or if she just had that sort of, Ursat's macaroni necklace. That no, so many, I, I yeah, had the yeah. art teacher with the macaroni necklace. Exactly. I, I um, did, yeah. But she looked like, uh, like if you hit Terrence Stamp over the head with like a cartoon <laughs> frying frying pan, and had she had like the sideways <laughs> eyes and was just always kind of like, what? well now, which way did he go? You of know, all the people on Earth, you went to Terrence Stamp. She looked like she had that. She had like the very bright blue eyes and the kind of spiky hair and just like a very round face. But then she, yeah, Terrence. She didn't have the Terrence Stamp voice <laughs> though. She before was, Zod. Yeah. I mean, That's more amazing. later, like Priscilla, Queen of the Desert, you know. Uh, <laughs> but she, uh, I remember one time she came, she came by, and I was like, I was trying to draw like art. I was trying to draw yeah. like actual, like I was like sketching somebody. For and her she goes, sake or for yours? It was an assignment. It was like okay. draw the draw the thing in front of you or yeah. whatever. And she she comes by and she goes, Oh, oh, I, uh, uh, it looks like the um, what's uh what's uh, the um, what's that show? The they got the um, they got the four fingers, and I was like, The Simpsons. And she's like, yeah, the, the the one guy, Homer, looks like, and I was like, at that point, this was like already like one of the longest running shows on TV. Yeah. And I was just like, what do you do? Like, what's your deal? How do you not know who Homer is? Yeah. And I'm like, I guess if you're, you know, I mean, that, and that's always kind of bugged me about art is that the separation of arts and entertainment has always been sort of, you know, separate. It's do been, you think that's true now? Or do you think it was more true when you were young? It's changed. Um, I think a lot of it has to do with just sort of mass media and, I mean, the things that people... I mean, cartooning, for instance, has always been sort of like a... You know, it's kind of like a, a, a bastard art form. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's, it's for the masses, you know, in the same way that, like... I mean, I guess crude humor is viewed as like, oh, it's not, it's not clever, you know? Mm-hmm. It's that kind of thing. Hi guys, uh, I'm Jared. This is Max. We're talking about art uh, because Max loves it. Yeah, and uh, something I that don't, you don't love. I, don't, it? Yeah. I, put I love some of it. I love some of ah, it. Are you thankful for it? Yes. Okay, but now, it's also that's like. Let's hear the nuance. You thankful for food? Uh, yes, except that it you know. What about kills me. what about water chestnuts? Uh, actually, I love water chestnuts. Okay, what about cucumber? I big fan of cucumber. What about cilantro? Uh, cilantro is one of my favorites. Okay, you're a fucking abomination. I hate beets. Okay, beets. There we go. Thank you. Beets. Hate, cauliflower. Hate there cauliflower. we go. Yeah, okay. Like so is. when you say you're thankful for food, obviously that doesn't mean all food. How can you food not is, like cilantro? I, I'm fine with cilantro. I was just giving an example. Okay, I really have an issue with water chestnuts and cucumber. Okay. Anyway, uh, art is like that. It's this thing that, how do you just, how do you define it? Is food anything you eat? Yeah. We were actually just listing ingredients, according right. to Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild. <laughs> you have to cook those things before they can become food and move to the other menu. Yeah. Um, but yeah, like, uh, I mean, art is so... I went to art school yeah. because I wanted to make art, and I dropped out of art school because I didn't want to make art in art school. Ooh, expound. I want to know. Um, so I, I went to... I. I I don't know. I've always been like an artsy kid growing mm-hmm. up. That was just kind of a thing. That's just sort of, it's just sort of you are or you aren't and it happens and it just, sometimes you get, I mean, you get either you're cursed with parents who don't want you to do that or you're cursed with parents who do. Yeah. Um, I wish my mom had kicked me in the ass and been like, hey, how about just 
get better at math and you know <laughs> learn like an actual skill set okay. and then find some way of angling that into art you know mm-hmm. um i've kind of like picked up graphic design here and there just in terms of like i don't know it just being like i've 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 been using photoshop i realized uh i first got photoshop and cracked it it was photoshop 7 oh wow okay so that would have been probably t- 2000 two, three, something like that. Wow, so very early. So half my life I've been dicking around in Photoshop. Did you regard it as an artistic tool when you first put No, your hands never on did. It? I, I think I initially got it because I was like, I want to learn how to paint digitally. Oh. I still don't know how to paint digitally. So you, I, you've never done like, you've never grabbed a Wacom pa- tablet and done digital paint or anything like that? I mean, there's literally a Wacom tablet like right behind you on top of a scanner. Okay. Uh, I've definitely done stuff digitally. I like to color digitally, but okay. I don't like to do the whole like, that whole like where people are actually like, oh, this is actually like a much less cancerous version of using paint. Okay. I like to get dirty. I like to get messy. I like to use actual physical paint when I'm doing paint, you okay. know. But if I'm trying to make like, oh, I want to do something that's got sick fonts, I'm not going to go get Letra Set and dick around with that physically. I want that in Photoshop. Makes um, sense. I also love just the the art of photoshopping, which is you know like chopping off something's head and putting it on something else. And, <laughs> The thing is, I don't, I don't really, I don't have like a magnum opus. I don't have the stuff that I actually set myself up to be like, I'm going to make this, it's going to be awesome. I typically kind of drop the ball on. Like I'm much better at sort of, uh, I guess the word would be like a la prima. Like a la prima is, is kind of like doing it in one sitting. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, like painters will go out and they'll be like, ah, I've got a model for an afternoon. And they'll be like, and it's like, maybe it's kind of sloppy. It's not like this beautifully, like, you know, perfect. Like everything's just, they didn't just nail it. The model, maybe the painting, no, I. But I'm better at those. I'm better at stuff on like on 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 bar napkins on the in the margins of of binders. Like the stuff that I'm most proud of is the stuff that's forgotten. It's the detritus. It's the stuff that's left over. Were you a trapper keeper kid? I mean, yeah. Like, did, what what did you have in the art in your trapper keeper? Did you do the thing where you stuck the paper under the under the trapper keeper that was oh full so of the that you okay so I had um. When you say trapper keeper kid, you know what I'm talking you about. You mean right? covering the, the binder at the front yeah, of the binder? Yeah, you cover the front of the binder with, you slide your art underneath the plastic. Right. That's yeah. not a trapper keeper, though. That's just a regular, like, that's just a well, regular. Well, you had the big trapper keeper. And right. Then you pull that and you stuck the art. So I had, a, I, had, a, I, had, school, I had an actual Mead five star trapper keeper that was, yeah. it got so beat up in school that I just d- devoted entirely to my my, uh, my anime fan art. Okay. So I had, like, folders in there and it was all like, just oh, full yeah. of your art. I, I don't think, it was, no, it was actually, so, there was an entire folder section in there that was for, uh, you know, a bubble jet printouts of, of JPEGs from Dragon Ball oh, Z just fan sites. Yeah. The yeah, yeah. Go, correct, but then there was like it. then there was all my stuff in there. I'd zip it all up and I'd be like, well time to go to go to work and then I'd like plop down on the couch <laughs> and be like, ah, last time on Dragon Ball Z. Yeah. Um but no like I was uh I was very prone to like you know like I wanted to like decorate my my school supplies, you know, that kind yeah. of thing. So I would have um I would ha- I would make these like very, very complex collages digitally mm-hmm. like i'd get like a microsoft word doc and i'd stretch out the margins so it covered the entire printable area of the page oh, wow. and then i'd basically make this weird like just very organized collage of things that i thought were cool okay they were none of them none of them were cool <laughs> there was there was nothing cool there um okay you're being really self-deprecating there here, was but uh, i've seen like you have art yeah. behind you, you yeah no no i mean there's plenty of actual you art have, yeah you know you have talent what are some things you created that you're like oh i wouldn't have bad um I mean, just I like I like I like funny monsters. Like I like I like weird like I like drawn critters. I've actually been. Uh, uh, I mean, I've gotten more into st- actually studying art, yeah. like paying attention to art. Well, and you what did the go to art is. school. Yeah, right? I, mean, I really liked art history. Yeah. I had an art history art history class art history class in uh, junior college okay. that was taught by this wonderful like, just very like soft spoken British lady. Mm-hmm. And she'd be up there at the front of the class, and it was right after lunch. It was like it was at like one thirty on like Tuesdays and Thursdays, and I'd get in there, and I would without question just be fighting to stay awake. Like it was like in some in some just bad spy movie where you're just like you've been drugged and you're like I need the antidote. And the only th- like I would just I would just be sitting there, and I and I, I looked like the worst student because I'd be like, <sighs> you know that kind of thing. Yeah. And I aced every quiz. Because okay. I'd be paying desperate attention. You were just um, relaxed. And I always felt bad because I'd go up and I'd be like, there was never any actual one-on-one time with a teacher because okay. it was all just a lecture class. Yeah. Um, the actual, like, the actual, like, you know, studio classes, I really like printmaking. Um, that's the thing about art, though, is that no matter what, how proud you are of something, like, there's always room for improvement. Okay. 
uh, and I guess I've always, I always see that with other people who are like, I don't, I don't like this thing. Uh, but there's like an odd, like there'll be the thing that you're really proud of in the moment. And it's like a, it's like a new toy on Christmas morning. You get this thing, you just, you love it. You're, you're so happy with it. And then maybe you sleep on it you come back to it and you're like, oh, sh- oh, that needs to change. I need to fix that up. And then you can keep doing that forever. Like you can always go back and chip away at things and just and add new stuff. And it's a matter of finding a stopping point and finding when is this finished. What's what's the merit of art? Uh, I don't know. I don't think there is. An, I, like, I mean, I think that you could argue that like comedy is, is like there's a... Laughter is a thing that takes place inside your brain in the same way that crying does, where something at a, just a fundamental structural level doesn't make sense, mm-hmm. and your body has a chemical reaction where you're just like, <laughs> or you, you know, like, and, and chemicals shoot out of your eyes. Like, there's animals that we see that are like, like an octopus sees something and it goes and just shoots ink and flies away. Yeah. Like, I feel like laughter and crying are kind of like, sort of human versions of that they're just a thing that we're like i don't know why i do it i just kind of do you know uh but with art there's not really there's less of a you know it's not like stand-up comedians you know like there's i mean there's you could argue that like poets are like the sad version of stand-up comedians maybe but even then there's like you know comedic poetry art is so much more kind of nuanced and varied Mm -hmm. um art is like you know sometimes it's like a tech demo um where a lot of a lot of modern art is like trying to prove a point. Okay. Like they're like, here's the thing we wanted to do. Like there's a thesis. You know, there's like there, here's what here's the idea here. Here's what I'm doing. Uh I fucking hate Mark Rothko. I cannot stand that that fucking guy. And I've gotten into so many arguments because I went to art school because people thought he was great there. But that guy's whole deal, my understanding is anyway, if you if you Mark Rothko just paints big big ass squares. He looks like he looks like shit you get from Home Depot when you're thinking about painting one of your rooms in your house. <laughs> like but there's like, like the a, bare paint strip. Yeah, or or if you go to like a really crappy hardware store and they're like they just put like a like we were trying to paint our living room upstairs mm-hmm. and we couldn't decide on the right shade of gray. Okay. So because we're horrible procrastinators, we basically had like a homemade Rothko on our wall where we just had this one stretch stretch of gray and then a different one between it and then another one below that and it was just up there. Uh, and Rothko's whole deal was he's trying to create a sense of depth using just color. Mm-hmm. Like he's not using, you know, light logic or rules with all that. He's just trying to be like, oh, this is a sense of depth. And, you know, there's there's lots of artists that uh, I think there's that kind of that almost cliche at this point that when you say something is like untitled, you're like, oh, it's 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 untitled. And the point of that a lot of the time is that if you give something a title, it you're automatically giving it a meaning okay. and a point, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh but at this point, there's actually like an expect. There's it's kind of a, you know, oh, this is untitled number twenty, and you're like, okay, well, so you've been doing this twenty times, you know, like it's it's also like okay, so you don't have anything to say. You, you want like, us to find the thing to say, and it's like, feel like it's kind of recursive. What's that? Recursive? Recursive? Uh, I, mean, I, I guess. I, I mean, um, I don't know. Like it's it's just. I think it's almost lazy. It's hmm, like, okay. uh, I mean, there's plenty of artists who who do it, but uh, yeah, I mean. Art is, it doesn't have a point. It can. It, mm-hmm. it totally can. And f- in fact, some of the art that has the biggest point is the stuff that's not considered art. Like what? Advertising. Architecture. I mean, architecture is is definitely like, at this point, we're like, oh, that's totally art. But it's also like, I mean, it's mathematics too. And it's it's a thing that has to function. No, I, I've I visited Florida Southern University a few times when I lived in uh, Central Florida. And uh, parts of that campus were designed by Frank, Frank Lloyd Wright. Yeah. And you could feel his anger at tall people. Every yeah. Day <laughs> uh, that was art. And I, I'm only half joking. Yeah. Like, uh, you would walk through the place and it was this kind of, it wasn't just claustrophobic or constrained. It was deliberately so. You could feel somebody wanted you to feel a different way when you were in this place. Mm-hmm. And then you suddenly walk into a relatively small room, but it would be opened up and you felt like you'd escaped from the labyrinth <laughs> and it, and it was this, and it's like, Oh, I, he managed to create light and air by drowning me on the way into this place. That's not actually all that big, but suddenly feels, so. yeah, I, I, that's definitely art. I, I don't know yeah. if I like it, but it's, but art. I mean, then again, maybe was that his intention or was that just a, a was that just a, a user experience? You know? Yeah. I don't know. Um, entirely. Yeah. So I, I don't know. It's, I like, uh, 
I like a lot of totally different artists. Like, I mean, in terms of like my favorite artists, it's not like I like this one category. Like I've kind of opened up my, my tastes a lot. Um, yeah. I went and saw a, uh, a Wayne Tebow uh, show. Okay. Uh, Wayne Tebow is famous for painting cakes uh, and like food and like, He'll, he has like a, he does like you know like here's here's it's one called three machines and it's just three gumball machines and if you see it in like a picture of it you're like this looks like a I don't know like a Gap commercial or something like this looks like something out of like a weird music video seeing it in person though you you realize exactly how much he's doing with the paint itself with the with the physical huh. with the with the stuff and I don't know if you've ever used oil paint oil paint sucks I have yeah. it's it's really cool when you get it to work right but most of the time you're waiting for it to dry. Mm-hmm. Uh, and if you get a little bit of it on you, you're never getting it off. And you also are probably going to die of, of either like heavy metal poisoning or some kind of new undiscovered cancer seven years down the road. Okay. Um, I had this, I had this uh, painting teacher in, in art school, uh, who looked like an owl. Actually, she looked, no, she looked like the owl, like the Spider-Man villain. Okay. Like she had like these crazy, like curly hair and like weird little round goggle, like glasses and wore like. Do you think she was in fact like part owl? Uh, I think so. Yeah, Did you I think she's. Head all the way around? Uh, no, but I'm sure she'd hide that. Except I also wasn't probably in the right major because I feel like if she was like a new genres teacher, she would have done <laughs> that. She'd be like, I call this one reflection. I'm like, you know. Um, but she uh, she gave this. We got this lecture on the first day of, of art school, and they were like, they were like, oh, welcome to art school. I'm very proud of you. This is a very prestigious uh, place to go. Uh, and then they were like, so anyway, uh, we're legally obligated to tell you all of the stuff you're going to be using and how it's going to make you die. And she told this story about how she's like, yeah, back in the eighties, I was, I was hot. I was a very sexy lady, but I also used to paint with toxic paint with my hands all the time. And I got some medical shit now. And it's like, also, it's possible Whoa. she just stopped being, being hot. But she's also like, had I known that there was some of the stuff that's in this stuff, I would have used gloves because so that would have made really sense. That, it's it's that abrasive. It's, oh it's yeah, that toxic. No, there's so much stuff. It's, and by the time that you like figure it out, like I mean, yeah. you know, you think back to, uh, I don't know, like in the in the 30s through 50s when doctors would be like, ah, a nice cork filtered cigarette, good to get that flavor in those lungs. And now <laughs> the doctors are like, are you out of your mind? Here, have this gin and drive home. You're yeah. you're crazy. Um, but like, it's the same thing with art supplies. Like back in the day, they were like, Oh, let's, uh, how do we get the right color for clouds? Ah, we need to get lead. Okay, Lots of delicious lead. That ought to and do it's, it. It's like, what if, what if we took just some weird shit we found on the side of a mountain and mixed it with linseed oil and then suspended it on canvas and like, but yeah, you do get that weird layer thing. Yeah. Like no, artists, artists you're, you're like, mentioning oil, yeah. like what, hey, what does an oil painting look like anything else when it's done right? I mean, I, that, that no, I, I mean, think about, I guess I, I, I'm, I don't want to talk too much is the interviewee, but I know that when I've, um, it's a very rare opportunity I've had to see a, a Van Gogh in real life. Oh God, it's um, nuts. One of the, yeah, it's, it's literally layered. It's, yeah. it's a landscape itself. Like the paint is a landscape on yeah. the canvas. It's yeah. extraordinary. No, it's, it's totally like I've, I've seen so many pictures of, of, of famous paintings and you know, you see like people with umbrellas that have like Van Gogh on them and you're like, Oh, starry night. That's so overrated. And then if you see it in person, you're like, Oh crap in a hat. Yeah. Uh, I went and saw a, a show that was like, it was um, the Dutch masters, not the, not the fabulous blunt raps, but the, the old, <laughs> old weird p- <laughs> pilgrim looking dudes. <laughs> um, Sorry. But they, me. um, their whole deal was like, portraits and light and they were doing like really incredibly subtle things with with light and you see it in, you see it printed it loses it loses something it something yeah. gets lost in translation there um also it's really hilarious to see a bunch of those in like one place i got i got i like to go to art museums and just talk shit <laughs> like i'll go with a friend and i'll just heckle the paintings and i don't give a shit because the guy who made them has been dead for 350 years do you heckle them out of the joy of, of the joke or do you heckle them out of frustration with it's the like artist, a, the thing you? is i can make fun of something and still appreciate it right. you know uh but like i don't know there's this whole wall of like of like you know vermeer and, and rembrandt and all those all those assholes and they were all just doing all these self-portraits where they're just like <laughs> and they're like and i was like I was like, look at these MySpace angle fuckers or whatever or something. And then this man in like Crocs and like a red beret gave me like the most angry look. And I was like, what? Like, what do you want? Yeah. I'm in a museum. I'm appreciating it, you know? And then, you know, you're around the corner and there's the girl with the pearl earring and everyone's like, oh, there was a movie about it. And I go around the corner and there's like this one painting that I love that's called 
Uh, God, it's like while the it's like while the old Jess, the young Twitter or something, and it's just this, it's just a goddamn Facebook party photo. Like it's totally just a bunch of drunk people hanging out, uh-huh. and there's like a bunch of kid. There's like kids sitting on the floor, and they're like touching these dogs that are probably speak of the, speak of the devil. Uh, these touching dogs that are probably running out, and like you know, like like plague urine or whatever the whatever was out in the streets at that point. And the, and the 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 whole like the adults are sitting at this table, and they're all like ha ha, and like they're laughing, and there's like a parrot in the corner for no reason, and they're just having a blast, and. It's the kind of image that we we conjure up with, like you know, if you go to if you go to a party, people are like, yeah. hey, take a photo, or like, oh, we're you know we're at a bar, like, I mean, you you can hire some like random dude to go around and snap photos at your at your club event or whatever, uh, but this was like this massive, just huge, huge picture of just these people just living and enjoying their life and like it really struck you. Yeah, I love who, it. Who was this? Who uh, was I forget. It's one of those one of those uh, one of those Dutch fellas. One of them Dutch fellas. Yeah, but I, I don't know. It's, I've never seen this image. Yeah, I, I'll, I, I'll show it to you. It's it it's really it's very cool. Right? Um, wow. But yeah, like I don't know. I I've gotten I've gotten to appreciate a lot of older what used to be I used to consider more boring art. Like mm-hmm. I was very when I was younger I was very into like. Ah, I want to look at Frank Frazetta. Like, I want to look at dragons. I want to look at stuff where there's like epic things happening. And I've learned to kind of appreciate the sort of, you know, the epic nature of just minutia. And what's just a, the, what's a piece of, of ridiculous art you love? Um, man, I do love I do love Frank Frazetta. Like, I love the I love his just his insane just metal artwork. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, how do you define ridiculous artwork? Oh, mean, I, like I think you get top? to define yeah. since you're the guest. Um, I mean, I can give you parameters if you want, but. I love there's there's a there's a Roy Lichtenstein uh, and Roy Lichtenstein of course does like the old kind of like you know basically pop art hyper blown up versions of of old like you know comic book panels mm-hmm. um, but there's one that I'm pretty sure is a close up of Magneto's eyes which of course is what made me like it because I was like oh I love Magneto he's one of my favorite characters from the X Men um, but it's called Image Duplicator. And it's just this giant speech bubble that says, what? Who told you about my image duplicator? <laughs> and it's just, I mean, there's obviously, you can draw all kinds of meanings about that, about pop art and reproduction no, and everything. And just, but like, I don't know, Lichtenstein always has this, and I think that's kind of, it's been an influence on on my stuff. For a while I would be drawing, I, I drew a lot of cartoons that always had speech bubbles. Like that was kind of a thing, yeah. a phase I went through. Uh, now I just kind of draw, I like to draw like monsters and creatures and weird people. And I like to kind of just, I don't know if I'm if I'm making people if I'm making stuff for people to look at. I like to make people make up their own stories, and I'm kind of making up a story as I go. But it's never really set in stone. It's kind of like a it's it's more of like a uh, like a Rorschach test. But instead of being like I don't know what does it look like, it's more like yeah, what, what's their story? You know, what's <laughs> what's their deal? I, a couple of questions that popped into my mind while you, while you were talking about that that, that got me thinking uh, down a couple of lanes. You remember the scene in Unbreakable? Uh, mm-hmm. where you first meet Sam Jackson's character yeah. and the guys in the museum talking about and Jackson's explaining the nuance of the comic art to yeah. him and the guy says my son will love this and oh, Jackson yeah. refuses to sell it to him Yeah. what do you think about the sentiments expressed in that moment I'm um, curious your thoughts on that I think it's interesting because it's it's, uh, it's an M. Night Shyamalan movie <laughs> and he doesn't really have the best track record of like I mean, it's it's ironic that he directed that scene and then proceeded to make The Last Airbender. You know, like he took something that had like an incredible amount of depth to it and just just shat it out. Uh, and it's like, I think the guy has had moments of, of being very talented, but it's also like, I think he kind of took this idea that a lot of people do where it's like, oh, comics are art. Comics are, are special and they're interesting, but... Uh, and obviously, you know, like Sam Jackson's character is, is, you know, he's, he's a real person in that sense. Yeah. Uh, but the thought that, I don't know, some guy would be like, yeah, I'll, I'll pay that much money for my kid. It's just such an odd kind of pairing of like, mm-hmm. of, of it, it's a, it's a kind of feels like an unrealistic situation. Yeah. Well, there's um, definitely, well, there's kind of a, a, a strange unrealism. It's part of what I think it makes that particular movie work. I, I, Shalom yeah. drives me nuts, but I like that movie a lot. Mm-hmm. That scene, I could never figure out whose side of that argument I was on. Um, yeah, I, I feel like I should be with it. Well, of course you give the comic to the kid because yeah. you know it's beautiful art, and someday you go, he may be even if he doesn't know yeah. what to do with it. Maybe it's enough that it may. I think about the well, but but at the same time, it's art. Yeah. Maybe you want to protect. I don't know. I think that I mean, there's there's art. There's like original actual artwork. Nobody in their right mind would ever ever buy like an original. 
piece of art. And if you do, you, you frame it. You don't give it to the, to the kid to play with or like or read or whatever. You buy them you buy them reprints. You buy them trade yeah. paperbacks or even you know used hand me down comics. Like my first exposure to comics, like properly, was a giant stack of hand me down uh, X Men, just yeah. old old beat to shit X Men, and I. Uh, was young enough that I sort of knew they were valuable and they were like my favorite things in the world. So of course I thought they were valuable and I was like, Oh, that's a, that's a, that's a first appearance of Iron Man. I looked it up and it's like, no, that's like the first appearance of Iron Man 2020. Like, what are you, what are you talking about? Like, and I was, I was trying my best to kind of line things up, but it wasn't really quite knowing what I was talking about. And I mean, it was fun. It kind of, it taught me stuff. Like I'd pick up issues of wizard and be like, Oh, reading the price guide, but that's not appreciating the actual, the actual thing that's not actually appreciating the art itself that's yeah. appreciating the appreciation of value yeah, that these value. things have well, had. yeah my father uh, told me growing up he had a, a it was during the the comic bubble of yeah. the early 90s and i you know i thought whoa look at the value of those comics and my dad told me he said jared i remember throwing away my fantastic four number one mm-hmm and subsequent issues, like because I've been reading them from the beginning. Oh yeah, and they were old comic books, so I got rid of them. Yeah, they're they're magazines. Why yeah, would you get rid of them? Yeah, it's just like I and I understand the values. Like, but honestly, I'm not sure I want to live in a world where that's how we think about these yeah. things. He really kind of knocked me on my butt with yeah. that. Yeah, no, it, I'm. It, I'm it, it was a friendly way he said it, but it hit me pretty hard. I understand wanting to collect things, and I like things that. for value, and protecting them, but it also really hit me. It's like I got what I was there to get out of them. They were yeah. great stories, and they made me happy. Yeah, no, I'm I'm <laughs> I'm in a weird spot right now. I'm trying to collect all of the Uncanny X Men released in the '80s because yeah. I love the '80s run. I love Claremont stuff. Uh, As incredible, well, you yeah. There's yeah. incredible art in there. Barry Windsor Smith does some like just absurd line work with what you're what you're looking at, and you know, typical like you know, cheap ass comic book. Yeah. Uh, but I don't want to pay like collector grade rates i don't care if they're if they're beat to crap like i've got a copy of like i don't know it's the it's the issue where storm fights uh callisto and the morlocks and it's like somebody read that in an actual sewer yeah it's like it's all it's all water stained and i like at one point i tried to sell all my comics because i was trying to like you know pay for stuff and i was like i need to get rid of these and i'm really glad i didn't uh going back to art i think that that's the one beauty of of art that can be like i mean it's it's mass-produced art i guess yeah. you know like the fact that comics are you know if you live i guess nowadays it's kind of difficult to get to find a place that actually sells comics they're not really they're not really that common oddly enough yeah uh but to recognize that like oh that somebody drew that somebody made that you know that's something that a robot cannot do exactly at uh, least not yet not yet i mean you can you can get those weird like like what are they Zwinkies or whatever? Like they're those, get Zwinky. I don't know. Oh my! I forgot those, about Zwinky. Wow. Yeah. Ooh, that that that's a blast from 2005 right or there. Those, like Ooh. those like text to speech things where they'll like they'll make like a CG animated short and you can like pick the skins for it or whatever. Well, but yeah, like, Inch and I were talking about this yeah. the other day. You know, we're waiting for waiting for the the computer that that you know for the for the AI that starts creating art and the discussion. And then people have written about this hundred million mm-hmm. times. But we're at Computer History Museum the other day, and they they have one of the early examples of of a program written to create its own art. You know how? At what point is the creator the creator of the program, and what point is the creator the program? Uh, yeah. You know what? If no, I mean, like, think about those like those pendulums that they I, they used to have one at a I don't know some science museum in Boston I used to yeah. go to, and there's just and I I never got it as a kid like I didn't care. I'm like they're like oh it's the it's the power of the earth is spinning it and moving it and like somebody I think somebody like touches it like once a day or something and it just yeah. it swings back and forth. Yeah, exactly and what you're talking it's about. like that spirograph shit. It's like it's cool, but like. What are you, you know, what are you telling me, you know? Yeah, not sure. Yeah. I don't know. That's the that's the great thing about art though. Is you can just go around in circles and like talk about a bunch of stuff and it's, it doesn't really Much you know. as we have here yeah, on this that's show. How, that's how it works. It's a lot to me. I, I one I, actually this seems a pretty good place to transition into Instant Noodles, the uh, collection of uh, random questions, but uh, is there anything we haven't covered that you want to say before we move on? Uh, when it comes to this because it's a, literally this this is a topic that has taken up thousands of books for thousands of years yeah uh, but, but so uh, here's one of my favorite uh pieces of trivia um hieronymus bosch who's known as kind of the mad monk he's like this he's he lived in this place called hertogen bosch are you and, a bosch uh, guy oh yeah no, i'm a huge bosch guy look at my little my critters and my monsters he's i love i love hieronymus bosch i've always loved him because when i was a kid and i was like you know dragged to the art museum i'd be like oh, okay there's a painting of jesus there's a painting of cows in a land a landscape or whatever and then you go around the corner and they're like, what? What is happening there? Yep. <laughs> like, if you've never seen like, a Bosch painting. <laughs> who spilled blood all over the Pokemon? Like, what happened? Yeah. Uh, Bosch is just a weird dude. Uh, and his whole thing was 
it was all it was all religious, but it was also people were like, oh, he was a crazy monk, and like historians don't really know what his deal is because and his and his style was always very sort of like rudimentary like he's kind of almost outsider art uh he lived in the middle of middle of nowhere people are like was he part of like a sex cult like what's the deal with that guy he was practicing at the same time as da vinci which is one of those like da vinci of course was living in i don't know where did he live da vinci florence was he florence okay. yeah he's florence i mean he probably like took like weekend trips like staycations or whatever you go down to, i don't know i don't know I, I clearly don't know enough about this but i know that he was inventing like flying tanks and like parachutes and yeah. gum yeah uh the pot-bellied stove bifocals i might be yeah, mixing up with ben franklin yeah, but i mean yeah i mean he was he was democracy uh he was made a Gatling gun that shot the Democracy. original Renaissance man. Like he was that guy. Kind of his deal. Yeah. He uh, literally had sketches of cathode ray tubes in his notebooks. Yeah, yeah. It's nuts. And then the fact that, I mean, you've got him and then you've got like Bosch up in the mountains and he's like, yes, but what if the tree was having sex with the bird and the bird has feet that are knives? And you're like, what the f- what's wrong with you? But I mean, that's kind of, I think that's kind of art in a nutshell as you can go back you know that far yeah and people are like doing incredibly drastically different things and i mean it still carries through to this day like you'll have you'll have people being like oh man i just i I smeared some some poopy all over this canvas because i hate my stepmom and then somebody else is like i um i 3d printed an entire uh, edible cathedral and you're like well these these are both of these things are terrible i don't want either one of these things but i don't know art's what you make of it you know it's if, if you say you don't like art then I don't know. It's like saying you don't like food. You 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 suck at it. <laughs> I imagine there are people that don't like food, yeah. and I imagine there are people that don't like art. But I imagine there are not many yeah. of them. No, I mean people yeah. get. I think people get scared off of it. Yeah, I think I they agree. overthink it, yeah. and it's like. I agree with you. Yeah. No, I, I think you're right there. I, yeah. Max, thank you for this. It means a lot to me. Of course. I, thank you so much for sharing something you care about and uh, and a unique perspective on yeah. it. I'm ridiculously jealous of you. Um, I have no acuity for visual art. It's because I have um, this funny dog. I. I also jealous because of that funny dog. That's true. That's that's really kind of like a kind of canine battle cat back yeah, there. It's a weird, it's a weird on. dog. Wow. Here's some of my art back here, actually. Yeah, actually, we we have karate. Yeah, going this on this over is here. this one's a this one's a, almost a true story. Yeah. Uh, so here's me in my prime. That you uh, in your prime. This would be me probably. This was a junior college joint. This was 2008. Uh, so there's me, uh, and I'm at the 7-Eleven in Sonoma. If you want to look it up, it's on West Napa Street. Uh, that guy who's behind the counter there does it. He didn't actually work there. I just couldn't draw that guy's face. Um, so that's a, that's a, a loose interpretation of what I used to do for fun. I'd go to the Seven Eleven and hang out and kick bottles around and kick bottles of uh, that appears to be a, a, a the delicious uh, corn syrup beverage Mountain Dew. Yes, yes. Uh, and what does it say on that sign with the hot dogs? Uh, it says, "Be a winner, eat a winner," and that didn't actually have signs like that. You just made that sign up. Yeah, because it's art. You can do what you want. Yeah, Why'd you choose to draw this? Uh, I think there was some prompt that was like, I don't know, it was like draw something, your life, or I don't remember what the point was. I'm, I'm wondering, why do both examples of the art that you chose to place behind us feature Mountain Dew? Oh, uh, I, I drank a lot of Mountain Dew at the time. Okay. I don't know. Very, I have a very, tattoo of it. Like you I've do got, have a yeah. tattoo of Mountain Dew on your body. Yeah. Did you design that tattoo? Yeah, it's just a, it's a bad little doodle. Um, yeah, actually, there's there's some questions in uh, an instant to this week about yeah. your tattoos, so I think I'll save that for there. From uh, we asked folks uh, from the community for some questions, and I have a few of my own here that I want to ask. So I'm going to mix up between those two. Uh, how many tats? Asks uh, Thomas Marshall. Uh, let's see. If we're if we're thinking in terms of sittings, um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, but. One of them is like a two-part thing. Uh, really, my problem with tattoos is my same my same problem with art is that I'm like easily distracted. I guess I really I really keep wanting to go and just get this like kind of filled in with weird doodles, and I don't really care. I don't particularly dis. I I, I don't like these ones because they're faded, and I need to get uh-huh. them touched up. So you'd like to get them touched up, but you don't want to get rid of them. Yeah, but in terms of like actual like quality, I don't really. I'm not really. I don't regret them. Yeah. I just kind of, I regret not having more. They really are napkin sketches. Like, yeah. you're right. I, I love, I never thought about them in, in those terms till just now. My dad was a napkin sketcher. And yeah. again, it, so they evoke, fall. although the fact that you have one that has both bat wings and the Orin on it. Oh yeah. So it's, uh, it's the state of Connecticut with bat wings. 
and laurel wreaths, and then the that's actually the thing on um, Mumra's chest. Oh, that's not the Orin. That's the thing on Mumra's chest. Yeah. I'm sorry, I got confi- I got my never-ending story and my Thundercats yeah. confused. Oh, um, yeah. It's easy. There's a lot of snake cults in the 80s. There were a lot of... But yeah, my, my thinking the there was... One too? Yeah, yeah, right? Yeah, there was there a lot was of snake cults. Yeah, big snake. Oh, James Earl Jones. Snakes. Yeah, totally. Um, but yeah, like, I grew up in Connecticut, and, like, my family's from there, and I was like, I want to get a tattoo of Connecticut... Kind of ironically, because nobody would ever get a tattoo. People get like Texas tattoos yeah. and California tattoos because those are like states with like identities. Like Connecticut doesn't even know they put like a tree on their quarter. <laughs> That's like one of their claim to fame is they're like, in addition to a fine public school system and a, a lot of rich people, Connecticut has the Charter Oak. What's the Charter Oak, you might ask? Well, it's the official oak of Connecticut. Yeah, they were like, they were like when Paul Revere was making his exciting ride through Massachusetts, one of our guys just hit a charter in a tree, and they were like, "Where's that charter? We need that to yeah. arrest you." And they was were like, that was that Israel Bissell that hit that? I have no idea. Israel Bissell is the other guy that rode that pie. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, I don't know. Yeah. This, I, no, I mean, like, literally, like, there's the whole exciting, like, revolutionary history of, like, oh, yeah, Paul Revere and the, the, the Battle of Boston, the Boston Tea Party. That was yeah. crazy. And Connecticut's like. We uh we took some uh, important papers and we hid them in an old yeah, tree. tree. <laughs> it's like, what's wrong with you? It's the boot the, the boot it's Radley so approach to revolution. Yeah, right, right there. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah. If you could get any tattoo, what would it be and where? I assume you can get any tattoo. I can it. theoretically get any tattoo, but that requires putting away a certain amount of money yeah. or being okay with spending a certain amount of money. Those are two things that I, I'm kind of bad at in both both directions. Like it, if money were no object, if you were to use that, that fat comedy button cash to, to solely for tattooing. Oh, I really, choose? so I really want to get, uh, I started, I started Photoshopping. I said, it'll at least be a t-shirt that I make for myself and then, and don't sell, just print it out for myself. Cause I like it. Um, I bought, I got some of the original Kenner Aliens action figures, and I very carefully cut off the. They were like they were, you know, carded toys, but they were like the, the bubbles were all fucked up. So I just like I cut around them because I wanted the I wanted the card art. And there's this there's that big purple alien that's going like, and there's a there's a the kind of green doorway in front of him, and I want to put that together with the with some cover art from old <laughs> old. Ja- like lounge jazz like Les, Les Baxter and Martin Denny and Esquivel and there's these bongo drums so okay. I want the alien to be like about Playing to play the bongo the drums. drums but they're with like palm trees and shit in the background okay you actually beat me to by the way that question was from Ross Hill you beat me to one of the questions I was going to ask you oh. which was about album cover art oh because um, uh, some of my favorite art is album art I oh yeah to- album art. yes totally yeah uh, for you uh, standout pieces of album art um ones that's just like wow those are because that's an advertising kind of art. Yeah. You know, that's a, that's a no, I mean, art it's I funny that we have imagery that's associated with certain genres because it's just like if you're like, oh, like heavy metal album covers, you're like, oh, that's that's a thing. I, I, I Clearly, this is my aesthetic and my style. Uh-huh. Um, God, that's really like, – it's also good graphic design. I want to say – I mean, most Iron Maiden. I think if I had to okay. p- pick a particular favorite, that's always tricky because I tangle up like favorite album cover with favorite album. Yeah. I think the best happy medium is Iron Maiden Peace of Mind because uh, Eddie's in a, in a uh, mental institution. Uh, but there's also one, uh, there's somewhere in time where he's like a, a cyborg from the future. <laughs> and then there's like killers when they were still kind of starting out, didn't really have the budget. So he's just like a guy with an ax and he's like, huh? Eh? But she's eh? like the kind of consistent theme. Um, yeah, yeah, I love that. Okay. Ooh, ooh, no, good answer. Um, Screaming for Vengeance, uh, Judas Priest, because it's just the oh. most. If I so if I had just endless money to do whatever the fuck I wanted, I would uh, I would fund uh, like Bandai snap together model kits, like Gundams, basically. Yeah. Of the machines on the cover of Judas Priest albums. Wow. Yeah. So. I would buy that. Yeah. So the the big the eagle from Screaming for Vengeance, yeah. and then there'd be like that dude who's bought a motorcycle with saw blades for wheels, like an asshole on Painkiller, and uh, the one that I really like is Defenders of the Faith, which is like a it's like a Megazord cat, but those things are they're so good. I love those things. That's thank you. That's those are spectacular answers, Thanks. And, and my mind never went to go on there. Which <laughs> I, I love it. They're, they're they're perfect. Patrick McKenzie asks, "What size shoes do you wear?" Uh, anywhere from eleven and a half to thirteen. Depends on the shoes. Oh, wow. Is it a width issue then? Or? Uh, I think it's a... What kind of shoes? Depends. Oh, okay. Like, dress shoes are usually, I don't know, tighter. I guess probably... That doesn't make any sense. Smaller socks? I don't know. Also, I'm, sometimes if shoes are too big, I'll just get insoles. I'm a cushy man myself, yeah. but cushy just went out of business, so I'm really sad. I can't okay. get my favorite shoes anymore. Well, if I have money left over from my, my Judas Priest Gundam kits, I'll uh, pass that your way. 
I, you, you're always talking to me about money. I don't know if, if you're aware of this, but uh, I occasionally ask for money on this show. Oh, yeah. This here show right here. Yeah, Give that man money. Here. He needs to buy more yeah, shoes for his weird shoe house. He's got to wear shoes for a weird shoe house. Actually, this is not a bad time for us to thank our Patreon uh, producers, Nick Rie and Robert Nieder, whose generous support makes this show possible. And to thank all of you who give on Patreon, who subscribe on iTunes and YouTube and all the rest of those places. Hey, guess what? You've heard this before, but uh, it's really important and helps keep the show going. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, yeah. Heading back in here. Uh, oh, I'm getting message while I'm looking through these, so I'm going to ignore those messages for now. Uh, favorite food to cook, asks uh, Pete Lannon. Um, steak is fun, but it always sucks if you mess it up. Uh, I think just, I like stir-frying stuff, you know, just kind of mixing it around. Grilling is good. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think one thing that's really fun, uh, two nights ago, I grilled like a bunch of drumsticks on the on the grill grill, and then I uh, we had them like cold and left over, and I was like... I'm going to just heat them up and just refrying like refried chicken. That sounds so gross, but like then throwing that in a salad is really, really nice. Actually, I really like refried chicken. Yeah. If it's done right. If it doesn't dry out. Right. That's the hard part. When it's still like a little bit, a little bit greasy, but yeah. then it gets the greasy stuff on everything else. Yeah, it's yeah. really good. Really good. Phil Mansfield asks, pizza flavored cake or cake flavored pizza? Pizza flavored. No, wait. Cake flavored pizza. Cake flavored pizza. Because that's it. You can do, you, you can do like dessert pizzas. Yeah. Totally. That does exist. Yeah. But Ever making... been to CC's, my good man? I don't know a word you just said. Oh, okay. CC's is... I don't even know if they exist anymore, but CC's was a place that for a time you could spend, I believe it was Did they three... cease to exist? They, they might have CC's to exist. They might still exist, but it was a, a, it was a quote-unquote pizza chain where you could walk in and it was for like for three ninety nine or four ninety nine, some ridiculously small okay. sum, buy unlimited pizza off their bar. And... It, it tasted like the kind of pizza that you could buy for five dollars in unlimited quantities yeah. off their bar, but they would always do terrible dessert pizzas okay. at one end of the bar. I remember that. So they actually do have a uh, cake flavored pizza. It's yeah. called a tart. Like that's just it's called a it's that's just what that is. A tart. A okay. tart. Yeah, a pop tart. Yeah. yeah. No, that's a square cake flavor. It's a school lunch pizza of cake flavor. There you pizza. go. That's the one. There we go. Uh we have a, a question here from uh, Chris Hamans who asks, which anime should I watch if I've never watched anime? Uh, if you want a movie, yeah. you're up for a much a much better experience. I would recommend either Spirited Away or My Neighbor Totoro. I think those are two of the best things ever animated, period. Uh, if you want something just kind of like insane and gritty and, and a little bit hard to follow, but also just stunning, uh, Akira, if you're willing to like power through 28 episodes uh, and get one of the better just start to finish kind of stories and things, Cowboy Bebop. Yeah, Bebop, Bebop, Bebop is good so good. It is. Bebop's ridiculous. Like, yeah. I, what those guys touch tend to be wonderful. Even, yeah. even, um, Have you seen Redline? Uh, some of it. Redline is another good one. Redline is effectively just like if Speed Racer was literally taking a lot of speed, yeah, and so then went to space and raced like a green woman, it's it's fun. Are you not recommending the? Uh, apparently, originally, uh, my Na- my neighbor Totoro was a double feature with Grave of the Fireflies. Yeah, don't do that. That was actually how they put that in theaters. I don't know why that was a yeah, good I idea. I can't even That's imagine terrible. that. Yeah, my you should to- see Grave. Have yeah, you, have you seen Grave? Uh, I never finished it actually. I I would could I don't li- I don't like that. It's very hard to watch. Yeah. Uh, it's really good, but golly. Ooh. Yeah. Gosh. Um, but yeah, I, I think uh, again, you're you're Captain Anime, but I, I love all the things Not you just Captain. brought. Up. I'm like a, I'm like a, a lapsed anime fan. Second Lieutenant Anime. Yeah, I'm like I'm I'm an anime fan the way Kevin Smith is Catholic. Like, <laughs> I don't really <laughs> dogma. It's yeah. Well, count, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, uh, Linus Morissette yeah. was God. She opened her mouth. Yeah, Alan Rickman was there. He's like everybody yeah. covered their ears. And yep. Guy's head exploded. Yeah. And Affleck's head. It's true. Exploded. Yeah. Maybe. That's a uh, weird movie. It's a good movie. Yeah, I like it a lot, actually. I, uh-huh. I, I like the fact the angels were banished to Wisconsin. I find that joke very funny. Yeah. Also, the whole, the whole like, uh, just the John Hughes thing. Just the oh. fact that they're like, why would why would uh, Jay and Silent Bob be there? And that actually, the movie, that movie got me into John Hughes. No kidding. Yeah. I went and saw that movie with my, my bride-to-be and my theology professor, the head oh. of my theology department. That sounds like a... That sounds just like a really hellish date. Actually, it was pretty know? great. We had a good time. <laughs> Yeah, it was it was my the head of my theology department, and his wife, and my 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 friend. Strange man. It was fun. We had a good time. It was a good talk afterwards. Um, let's see. Uh, what's your favorite thing you've ever created? That's a hard question. Uh, yeah, that's a really hard question. Um, 
Yeah, favorite questions are always always difficult. I like them, uh, but... probably my old show study hall. Like that was basically me kind of dumping my brain, uh, and it was themed episodes. So it was like, hey everybody, this week I'm at the 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 end of the world from Fallout or whatever. Here are things you might like if you like Fallout. Okay. From uh, Cam. Uh, oh, no, that was from Cam right there. Pardon me. Um, this one from uh, from Stevie. What's your favorite mundane adult thing to do? Mow the lawn. You like mowing the lawn? I fucking love mowing the lawn. Really? What oh, is it so about funny. it? Uh, <laughs> I mean, you're using a, a gasoline-powered war machine to just <laughs> fuck up some grass. Also, I'm really bad about it. Like, I'm like, I don't... My lawn is, is just... <laughs> my lawn is like, if you had a... I don't know if anyone's ever gotten a haircut. It's like, no, it's, here's what it's like. It's like those dogs that they find on the street and make Reddit posts about where they're like, we found this dog. He's barely recognizable. And they're like, here's what he looks like now. And it's like, he's still dirty as hell, but they just cut his hair. Yeah. Like, that's my lawn. Like I've got all these weeds and shit coming through, but I just, I'm like, ah, <laughs> my favorite thing about walking through your lawn is actually the porch where, where you have a very nice kind of pristine, cute house. And it's got little quirky yeah. things on the outside. My favorite is for some reason, there's a single human skeleton foot just sitting on one of your yeah. steps all we by went, itself. We went to buy Halloween decorations at like 4.30 on Halloween, and that was all they had left. It's just one skeleton foot? <laughs> yeah. Well, it's. I think it's. We're, we're recording this in March, and it's still there, uh, which is which is kind of wonderful. Well, yeah, it's it's sick. I also have a... <laughs> I don't know. I'm Yeah, I'm like a... I, I go between being like this sort of like Hank Hill, like lawn dad type, where yeah. I'm like, I need to trim the grass. It's getting real nasty out there, and being like... Glenn Danzig, where if like my chimney exploded, I'd be like, I don't give a fuck. I'm gonna leave that up there. Let the homeowners association call me about my scary bricks. Can uh, can we just sit now and, and shift the entire conversation to King of the Hill for the next six hours? Oh yeah, yeah. Okay, we yeah. can just do that because that's my favorite. I, that show, I love that show so much. Oh, I think it's my favorite thing that's ever been on TV. Uh, it's I, so I like it's so subtle, and I, I I need to go back and and follow through with like the the the, the late episodes because I I I went through like a binge watching era with that and like the first X number of seasons I'd yeah. seen each episode like four or five times and I know that they're huge like kind of like they're, they're big finales and their plot points like yeah. the whole Megalomart explosion and then there's like and Lucky shows up and it's not, it's still it's never not good like yeah. the show's always consistently good I think it's less good when Lucky's around some of the time but then there at the end it gets really good again yeah I, I, I think you need to go back to those yeah. episodes I should, I should check it out there's yeah. a lot of stuff in those seasons worth going to oh yeah and, totally oh man I Oh, we're going to do, yeah, if you guys, and don't just until you try it, folks. Um, let's see, uh, Ronnie asks, has meeting your dad changed your view on whether or not you want to be a father? Are you on, came on the show before and talked about the story of meeting yeah. your father as an adult? Yeah. Um... Which, by the way, guys, if you haven't watched uh, or listened to, it's a pretty amazing story. So I think that, uh, I mean, since a pretty young age, there was always sort of like, I was kind of wanted to be a, like when I was a kid, I was like, I was never like, I don't want kids. Cause when you're a kid, you don't know what that means. You don't know what it, like an undertaking it is to have kids. Uh, I'm actually at the age where I should start thinking about that seriously. Uh, the fact that I do suck at mowing my lawn and there is like a small skeleton foot on my porch is like kind of indication <laughs> that maybe I'm not quite ready. Uh, so I'm still kind of piecing things together, but it's like that terrifying reality that like, like when the, when the waitress gives you your menus and you're like, I should, I should pick out something to eat. You're like, Maybe you don't do that. Maybe you just space out or you like, you know, look at stuff on there and just don't really think about what you particularly want or you maybe you talk to whoever you're eating the meal with. But then the second the waitress comes back, you're like, oh, fuck, what do I what do I get? It's kind of like that as you get older and you have to actually be like, oh, do I want this thing or not? But instead of it being like a burger, it's like a human person who you wow. spend the rest of your life with. Um, meeting my dad definitely changed my perspective on it because at one point I was like, it was almost like I want to have kids out of spite or like out of like, not spite, but like out of like proving, proving kind of him wrong or like, you know, hmm. my dad wasn't around. I want to prove that I can be a good dad in spite of that. Uh, but having him around makes me like, I don't know, know that there's something in me. Like it's kind of like a, a weird like blueprint being like, oh, like you'll figure it out, you know, hmm. and you will be okay and you will get get the handle on it. But uh Yeah. So that's, yeah, that's a remarkably John Updike answer right there. Like that's uh, wow. Yeah, I mean, if anything's made me change my perspective on having kids, it's uh, growing up for you know the progress of time. Time just continuing to 
do that. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. Do its thing and yeah. gradually bring that day of decision closer and closer. Yeah. What if it doesn't? I might have to get more skeleton parts on my porch to scare away the neighborhood children so they you don't come what? on my pristine I lawn. That, I think that foot is really, really lonely out there. Yeah. I also love your description of uh, of, of lawnmowers as, as motorized death. My favorite thing about about lawnmowers is when you run over a turd and it just smells like war. Yeah, it just, that is awful. Like I'm always just like, oh, it smells like burning and shit. You're just like, oh, it's probably what Battlefield One would smell like. I don't want to play down. Like I, I've been, you know, I understand the the power of trauma. I really do. Like, yeah, yeah. Horrible things can happen that are traumatic. But when I was a teenager, I was pushing a push mower, and I accidentally ran over a baby bunny that was hiding oh yeah you told this story yeah that messed with me (sighs) yeah don't shred a baby bunny in a lawn no they scream oh Uh, it's yeah it was one of the most awful things yeah yeah i i still okay i don't know why i told this story man another one about the grace is asking i want to know about them tats okay well i think we got that we got Um, the tats Another uh, one about the, wow, Twitch wants to know about the tats. Lots okay, all right, all right. Here's, here's here's another one. I got one on my ankle, which no one ever sees unless they go to the pool with me, which Ooh. is a rarity. I don't go to the pool a lot. I don't know why I'm saying it like that. Um, it is the word danger, and I did it myself with an exacto knife and some India ink in art school because I was hanging out with a real weird girl, and we were just like, hey, let's stay in tonight and so you give, your give ourselves pre- tattoos. Tat? Like pretty much in art school. Uh, yeah, and it's like, it's, I don't know, it's legible, it's very, it's very like, why did you put danger on your ankle? And I was like, as I was like, just being young and stupid, and I don't know, it's like, it's just a dumb thing, I'd love to get it covered up with something else. But it's also like, it's always covered up with socks, so I don't really think about it. Like, if it was something that stupid on my body, I would have had it taken care of by now, like on my visible body. Yeah. But it's not, so people are just like, does that say dancer? Were you a were you a dancer? Were you like did you like to dance? And I was like, no, I don't like to dance. It's dangerous. What's really funny though is the girl that I did that with. Uh, I had India ink, which is like proven to be tattoo ink. Yeah. I also had Higgins Design ink, which is permanent on paper and so forth. But I don't know what it does, tattoo wise. She used blue Higgins Design ink. What's it do? I don't know. We don't we don't hang out anymore. I'm oh, not okay. marrying her. She's crazy. Uh. But she gave herself like a word that said rad with two exclamation points. And whereas mine was on the inside of my ankle, hers is on like the f- sort of the side of her foot. So she might just have some really weird like like fucked up tattoo. Yeah. Or, she, or she might just have like a scar or something. Oh, I wonder. But yeah, that's what's, what's really great though is she was like, Remind. she was a very nice girl. Uh-huh. Uh, definitely kind of out of my league in terms of what she was like willing to like she's definitely more into drugs and like and like crazy like kind of being like crazy like that you know like i think it was the fact that she sort of had like a a, a, she she was rich (laughs) so she had that like rich girl crazy going on i don't know rich girl crazy i haven't been around it it's terrifying it's like you know that oh it's like what would you do if you or what would you what would you do if you could if you knew you could not fail? Or that fucking James Dean dorm room poster. It's like, well, there's a reason that James Dean like fl- flipped his car, like because he's like, I don't know. I'm gonna move on to a, yeah. to another question here. Um, who's your favorite person to make laugh? Who do you enjoy making laugh? Oh, um, I mean, probably my probably my fiance, honestly. Yeah. I. Um, uh, I mean, Brian, too. Brian's, like, one of the funniest people I've ever met. Probably the funniest person I've ever met. So the fact when I can make when I can make him laugh is good. Marty is one of the easiest people to make laugh I've ever met. Mm-hmm. And he has, like, a very fun laugh. So when he yeah. laughs, I just feel better. It's just, like, an easy, like, instant gratification thing. It's Marty like, laughs like a Sesame Street Muppet. Ah, 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 like, ah, not ah. just a Muppet, but, like, a, ch- a Muppet designed to make children happy. Yeah. Like, yeah. Uh, actually, he's kind of designed that way in general. Yeah. Uh, but but yeah. No, but he's just he's just a good going, good easy going guy, and like yeah. I don't know, he's like he laughs a lot. And it's like that makes yeah. me, like that makes me enjoy his company. Like it's great. That's a great. Yeah. Thank you for that. Yeah. What's your favorite kind of button to press? Button? Yeah. Like in the world, in all the worlds of buttons. Oh. What kind of buttons do you? That's funny. I was press? actually we have uh, the toilets at IGN are like are they they're supposed to be those motion operated ones? Yes. Yeah. And somebody uh, fucked up one of the urinals real bags, so it's got like this big like like black garbage body bag over it 
and somebody was using the other urinal, so like, okay, I'll go take a whiz in the in the the flusherman's toilet, the regular old the regular old stall. Yeah. And I was like, I probably spent way too much energy, not only just leading up to this, but also just thinking about the button press because it's normally got the little like the little motion sensor that if you're wearing a black shirt, maybe just flushes while you're taking a shit. But if you actually just pee and you're like, it doesn't know what you're doing, you have to push it. And it's like a, it was like a weirdly, it was like a keyboard button. It wasn't like an industrial like. Okay. It was like a, it was like a little, little, it was like, like a digital little, button, just like a little click, not like digital, yeah. but like more. It was like a, it was like a, uh, like a vac metalized like plastic, like it yeah, felt like, like a, a like keyboard a, button. Yeah, like and I was like, this okay. is like that's I don't I'm like what what is in there? Is there like a little? Is there like a computer? Like what? There's like, got to be something going on back there. Yeah, I don't know how I thought felt about that. I think our like um, uh, arcade cabinet buttons are great. Those are yeah. like a kind of classical button. I like those um. I like those very industrial but not like high traffic buttons. Like when you use a button, uh, I think these are frequently on like on those those water and, and air machines they have at gas stations. Oh yeah yeah yeah. Where they're like where they're like, it says twenty five cents, but legally yeah. they have to let you just turn it on. So they'll be like, there's a button on the side, just press that. So if you push that, it's like a weird like. Ooh, yeah, yeah kind of that. I know yeah. the I know the feedback you're talking about. Yeah, it's a that's good, a that's wonderfully a good lucid description of that. Wow, that was that was beautiful. Thanks. I like buttons. What's something you enjoy doing when the power goes out? Uh not working. Yeah, I feel like, like so most you're, talking, of, you're thinking about at work. Like most okay. of the power outages I've experienced recently have been we like we don't have thunderstorms in California. Like I live yeah. in an incredibly like wired part of the country. Uh, Whenever there's been a power outage, it's been either at work, one of my various jobs, and it's hilarious because I work on the internet, so people just wander around and they're like, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. They're like, we'll just like, I, I would say get drunk is fun. Like, get drunk in the dark because there's something so apocalyptic about that. It's like, what are we going to do? And it's like, well, nothing's bad yet, so let's get drunk. Last question for today. If you, um, if you find yourself at home watching daytime TV, what is it? Oh man, I don't have TV, so I can watch anything I want. If I'm sick, I have a select bunch of movies I like to go to. Yeah. Like if I'm sick and I'm like really sick and I'm like feverish and I want to just kind of like f- just see where that goes, I'll put on uh, David Cronenberg's The Dead Zone. Oh, nice. Because it's just so weird and off the rails. Yeah. Or I'll put on uh, Blade Runner: The Director's Cut, not the final edit, but the director's cut because it has these long, just banks of silences. Yep. And if I've been taking like Nyquil or whatever, and, I, and I'm like legitimately sick, I'll like drift in and out. Uh, and if I'm just kind of like I need to, I need comfort food, I'll put on The Goonies. Um, that's a trifecta of excellence, yeah. right there, my friend. But in terms of like TV, like I don't. That's one yeah. thing I do miss about about having actual TV is watching trash when just i'm home randomly turning it on and have yeah trash on. it's yeah. probably best it's out of our lives but still it's uh yeah it's, i grew up in the era where where when daytime television was still like alternated between soap operas and reruns of the end of griffith show yep um which was a, a very strange time in television but it was just they were just filling yeah like, space i and, really and the program i wish there was a. I wish there was like a time caps i wish there was like basically a customizable nick at night that would roll in commercials of your of your choosing. Oh, you know, I I would I could live in a universe. I would pay a subscription. I've I've talked about this before. I would pay a subscription for a channel that just showed me exactly what was on down to the commercials that time thirty years ago. Yeah, like no choice in what no, the show. Awesome. No cho- and I just I would pay a premium to yeah. watch. I realize it would be the end the an impossible rights issue. Yeah, but I want that to exist. No, it'd be awesome. Uh, I recently bought like the fourth season of family matters on Amazon. And I put that on. I was like, this is great, but at no, at no point is it going to tell me that fish police is coming on next. Oh, you know? Wow. Fish police. I'd forgotten fish police. You know who else forgot fish police? Uh, the Everybody. <laughs> yeah. On the other hand, late, late season family matters when it gets all kind of sci-fi and Urkel's, you know, built oh, time machines and, and all kinds of weird stuff. Oh yeah. I think shrink ray at one point. Didn't he yeah. No, he got yeah. real weird. Yeah. It was, it was, it was, yeah. It was, a, it was a weird time in television. And I'm not sure I should be nostalgic for this or not, but I'd love to go back and find out if I should. Yeah. So. yeah. All right. Hey, Max, thank you for this. Thank you for coming back on. Thank you for all the marvelous doors you continue to open in my life. Thanks for being a friend. Of um, course, man. Uh, thanks for thanks for hanging out in my, my weird, like, just makeshift rumpus room set. My favorite part I feel like of, a real YouTuber. Yeah, I, I haven't been down in this room before. I've been to your house many times. I've but, never been in this room. Yeah, this is a room that kind of shifts around. We don't really use it for much. Uh, I don't know how to use it for much, but 
I want to point out this is not my manga. This is not my. It's not mine. It's it's my fiance's. Okay, that's somebody else's. I don't I don't read the I don't read the Ranma. I don't read the Naruto. I don't read the Dragon Knights. I don't know what that says. Okay, but you don't read those. I love that you have an exercise bike in your basement. That's my favorite part. That this says adulthood. Yeah, I don't use it. Ever. Oh, I know. That's oh, it. God, no, no one does. Yeah, it's it. It's got. It actually has a spray bottle of cleaning liquid like hanging over the handlebars. Yep. It's yep. great. It's kind of wonderful. I wish folks could see. Guys, thank you for watching and listening. Max, uh, what, what do you got to plug? Oh, uh, you can check out all kinds of stuff that I do. Uh, check out the comedy button. If you're supporting Jared on Patreon uh, and you're, you've got an extra buck to kick around, we do uh, a very kind of close, intimate show. Comedy button, for those who are not in the know, is me and three of my best friends. Uh, we've been doing this show for five years. It's kind of like X-Men. There's really no good jumping on point at this point. Uh, <laughs> I would say they're pick all up. good jumping on points. Yeah, that's a nice way of spinning it. Um, but we do uh, we do two Patreon exclusive episodes, which frequently just get incredibly weird. Uh, so, thecomedybutton.com for free episodes uh, four times. What is it weekly? Yeah, there's something kind of Lovecraftian about you guys' Patreon exclusive episodes. I agree. Yeah, oh, they're, it's... they're they're a marvelous. Well, descent. they're kind of like the color out of space. I really enjoy them. Yeah, we'll get uh, we'll get like. We'll start to introduce an episode like it's an episode that we're doing normally, and then one of us will be like, "You don't have to do that." Like, <laughs> yeah, it's you're, you're in a safe place. You really should listen um, to the comedy button if you don't. It's it's a it's a lot of fun. There's all the, and it's a it's a show instilled with friendship and love. Uh, yeah, which is which is a lot of fun. And sometimes love does. means making fun of somebody that you're in the room with, and I don't know. Sometimes people are like, "You guys are me to each other," and it's like, "Yeah, I don't know. That's we're just hanging out, we're having a good time." Um, if you want to see kind of a more relevant thing that I do, check out Up at Noon. That's the weekly variety show I do with uh, Brian Altano on IGN. That is live every Thursday noon Pacific time and then uh, up recorded shortly after that. It is one of the most infuriating things in the world to try to get people to watch the full show uh, because it is an hour-long, mostly visual show. Uh, sometimes people ask for it to be in podcast form, but it doesn't quite work. But um, yeah, it's it's basically just like a weird kind of junk food talk show where we talk about superheroes and science fiction films and uh, occasionally actual junk food. <laughs> Max, thanks for coming on. Folks, thank you for watching. You can always contact us with your stories at mail at pocketsfullofsoup.com. That's mail at pocketsfullofsoup.com. And yeah, you know, uh, always, always mention the Patreon because it's extremely helpful. Uh, so if you can drop over to patreon.com slash Jared Petty, that's patreon.com slash Jared Petty. Uh, your support keeps us on the air, and I appreciate it. Um, so that that skeleton, that why isn't that with your skeleton foot? Well done. Enjoy your visit. It's going to be a long one. <laughs> Secret out.